Thank you, Zandra. Thank you so much. And thanks for the organizers and uh, the committees for uh, allowing me to talk to you today. And good morning. Thanks a lot for showing up so early. Um, I should have another disclosure, which is I'm not an expert in the inner ear. Um, luckily, I have Zandra's husband, who is an expert in the inner ear, as a great collaborator. So um, that's what made this project go, go forward. So I'm going to be sharing some recent data, um, again, with our collaborator, David Corey. Um, using exosome associated AAV to treat um, uh, inner ear hereditary uh, deafness in a mouse model. So uh, the talk overview will be um, about hereditary deafness background, gene delivery challenges of the inner ear, um, exosome associated AV vectors for gene delivery applications. Of course, Anastasia gave an excellent uh, background on exosomes, so that'll save me some time on those slides. Uh, and finally, um, our functional data showing re partial rescue of hearing and vestibular function uh, in a mouse model of human deafness. So hereditary deafness affects about one in a thousand births and, um, and they have a genetic cause. And there are about 70 known causative genes for hearing loss. Uh, interestingly, 90% of deaf children are born to hearing pa uh, parents so this le can lead to some developmental delays because the, pa the parents don't usually know sign language, so it's more difficult than for um, children born to deaf parents. Uh, many of these genes affect the function of the sound sensing cells of the inner ear called hair cells. And those are the target cells for the, the vector system we're going to be talking about today. Um, humans only have about 15,000 total hair cells at birth, so just keep that in mind when you're cranking up the music. Um, once they're gone, they don't regenerate. Uh, I think birds can regenerate hair cells, but, but uh, we don't. So here's a uh, diagram of, of uh, the ear and the inner ear. And let me see if I can. Oops. Where's the pointer? All right, looks much cleaner than my son's inner ear, or ear. Um, but we're gonna be focusing on this part of the inner ear. So uh, the cochlea responsible for sensing sound waves and then the uh, vestib uh, vestibular system, which um, has hair cells as well, but is responsible for balance. So hair cells of the cochlea capture sound waves and turn it into a neural signal. Our brain recognizes the sound and the hair cells of the vestibular system operate in a similar manner, except they provide information about up or down and uh, balance. So uh, basically, you get fluid in the ear sensing uh, being moved by sound waves. This moves the basilar membrane up, which hits this tectorial membrane. And the hair cells, they're called hair cells because they have these stereocilia, they push up and get bent on this membrane. That leads to a mechanical depolarization of the cell and neurotransmitter release, which uh, sends a signal to the brain so we can so we, uh, interpret sound. And these are the actual uh, stereocilia on a, on a hair cell at high magnification. These are the ones that get bent and um, lead to signal transduction. So gene therapy for deafness, although it's very, uh, it's advancing very rapidly with some uh, really great papers coming out recently, um, it's not as advanced for other gene therapies, um, mostly due to inefficient transduction of the, of the hair cells in the cochlea. Uh, AV can uh, has been shown, such as AV1, to transduce inner hair cells really well, um, but outer hair cells are quite resistant to transduction. Um, and why do you really need to transduce both types? Well, the outer hair cells can amplify sound by about 50 decibels, and they're really crucial for speech perception. So. Um, any good gene therapy for, or for any type of hearing loss is going to really need to transduce both hair cells. So there's opportunities for gene therapy um, for hereditary hearing loss, which I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, for recessive, you can use gene replacement. Gene replacement that's the model we're going to be using. For dominant mutations, you can use genome editing. For acquired hearing loss, which affects a much larger portion of our population, especially as you get older, uh, you could use some hair cell um, regenerating hair cells. I said they can't, but you can use like stem cells and some really fancy ways to turn non-hair cells into hair cells. That's being 
developed by uh, other investigators. And you can also work at the level of the synapses that they tend to pull away during hearing loss. Um, but that's for, again, for, um, for acquired hearing loss. So I really don't need to do too much background on extracellular vesicles. I'll go over it quickly for, for anybody who wasn't here for Anastasia's talk. Um, basically, they're small lipid vesicles. I mean, you can give it a range. I gave it a range of 10 to 500 nanometers. Um, they're released by cells that contain a lot of protein and nucleic acids. Um, they're called by many names. Some have reasonings behind the names, and some are just coined by the individual lab. But uh, exosomes, microvesicles, microparticles, exosomes, oncosomes, and many kingdoms of, uh, uh, of life produce exosomes, including mammalian cells, bacteria, mycobacteria, and fungi. So these are just some cryo EM pictures from Alan Brisson, a collaborator in France. And we've actually, uh, he did this immunogold um, labeling of some receptors on the surface to show. But you can see there's even vesicles within side vesicles. <clears throat> so like viral vectors and viruses, uh, there's multiple mechanisms for entry um, into, into cells using, they, they're uptake, they're taken up very rapidly in many different cells. Um, I'd say the most uh, data so far shows they go through cleft-mediated endocytosis, but there's other um, mechanisms as well, such as direct fusion and phagocytosis. And as Anastasia showed herself, and uh, many other groups have shown, they're being harnessed as gene deliveries uh, for um, uh, different types of therapy. Um, most have done siRNA or microRNA, and some, some uh, researchers have loaded these with drugs. And not, not too far, uh, a couple years ago, um, there's these two papers, and there's more and more coming out that are showing that viruses can intersect with exosome pathways or even hijack them to use them for their own uh, benefit, such as uh, hepatitis A, which is a, is a coronavirus, classically defined as a non-envelope virus. But at some stage of its life cycle, it's been shown to be enveloped, and it can hide from uh, neutralizing antibodies. Um, hepatitis C, which is an envelope virus, was also shown to be associated with exosomes to hide from some antibodies. Uh, and we, we found, um, uh, in, we published in 2012, that uh, in packaging cells for AAV vectors, we could see, not surprisingly, a lot of vesicles being released from the producer cells. Um, but we could also find AV associated um, at, at a low level with uh, with vesicles. So uh, we, we called the system exo, exosome associated AV or exo AV. Um, we hypothesized that if you combine the properties of EVs and, and AV, you could, you could have some, uh, you could overcome some of the challenges in gene delivery. So just to give you an idea of our current method of production and what we're going to be talking about today for the preps. Um, we isolate the media for the um, exo-AAV, just do differential centrifugation and pellet and isolate the exo-AAV. And then for the conventional or standard AV, we just isolate from the cells and do density and iodixinol um, centrifugation and purification. Uh, we've, sh we've seen using amino gold labeling for intact capsids we've sh on 293 cells producing AAV. We've seen the AV, which looks like it's coming off in budding vesicles. And we've also, we've also done immunogold labeling to see it in, um, in isolated from the media. So you can see that there's multiple labelings inside a single vesicle. And uh, again, with our collaborator, Alan Brisson in France, who does cryo-EM, which gives us a real nice native structure of, of the vesicles. Uh, we first looked at standard, uh, this is AV1 capsids. And then these are two examples of the exo-AV, you can see multiple capsids inside the vesicle, and you can see some uh, on the inside and some down to the surface. Um, this just to give you a little contrast so you can clearly see the capsids. So here's some of the potential advantages we see with, um, with exo-AV. So with standard AV, if you have the receptor there, you may or may not be able to transduce the cell, but likely you can. If the receptor's not there, it's unlikely to be resistant. Um, as Anastasia said, there's not multiple receptors on the EV surface, and we've um, seen that you can enhance transduction of some cell types that are resistant to conventional AV. 
we have also hypothesized that we could avoid these pre-existing antibodies, which is a problem in, um, in the clinic currently, uh, whereas the, we hypothesized that you could avoid these antibodies more so with the, with the XLA disease. And finally, uh, they're relatively easy to engineer compared to a capsid, um, that you can put a lot of uh, ligands on the surface relatively easily without disturbing the structure for targeting. And we also think, uh, we'd, we're just starting to work on this, but we could co-package uh, two different vectors for um, these split genome delivery systems. So we've shown uh, some of these, uh, we've provided evidence for some of these benefits for antibody evasion, for enhanced CNS delivery at low vector doses, and for gene delivery across biological barriers. And I also wanted to point um, your attention to this talk uh, uh, from a collaborator in uh, Federico Mangowski's lab um, coming on Saturday that uh, characterizes the system um, in uh, model hemophilia. So now I'm going to talk about a recent paper um, uh, dealing with rescue appearing using XOAV. And uh, apparently this is Team Plaid here. I, we didn't coordinate this. Uh, <laughs> But the guy to, to really focus on is Ben Fiorgi. He, he really had the idea to test our system in the interior because he's working both in, in Xander's lab, my lab, and David's lab. And um, he drove this project to, to completion. So uh, I don't want to confuse myself or you. I'm going to be saying transduction. I might say mechanotransduction. So transduction is what we're used to, AV transduction, transient expression. Mechanotransduction will be the activity of the hair cells in response to sound. So Ben's first just simply um, took um, uh, P0 uh, cochleas out of ex cochlear explants out of neonates and um, added AV1 or XOAV1 preps. We started with AV1 because it's been the most widely described vector in the inner ear so far. Um, and what we observed was uh, while AV1 does do fairly well at inner hair cells here, uh, which you can see uh, in this myosin staining. Um, the outer hair cells were much uh, more highly transduced with XOAV, and this was quantitative. And then we also looked all along the cochlea from the base to the apex. You can see a bit of a gradient, which has been reported by, uh, by other groups, including Jeff Holt's group, especially with AAV1. Uh, we also tested AAV9, and to our surprise, um, in our hands, AAV9 was, was quite good in, in culture. Um, I'm not going to show the data today, but it didn't, it didn't pan out in vivo, but in cultured explants, it was, um, it was good, and we got, a, we got an enhancement with XOAV9 to bring it up to close to 100% transduction of inner and outer hair cells. Um, so I'm going to be talking about now in vivo injections in neonatal mice, which is something I've never done, and um, only a few very talented people can do this. But we're going to be going into the, uh, the round window membrane as well as the cochleostomy. So the round window is going to go into the perilymph, uh, and then uh, the cochleostomy is going to be going into the endolymph. So um, basically you have your scalar vestibula here, that's perilymph, scalar tympani, cont perilymph, and then this is the where the space for the cochleostomy, the endolymph. And here are your little hair cells right down here. Um, so this is the cochleostomy shown uh, here. And what we found was, uh, well, we had decent transduction of the inner hair cells. Um, we had an enhanced transduction of, of both the inner and outer hair cells. And Benz did some massive uh, quantitation efforts to show that this was significant. Um, he did see that uh, there was enhanced intensity of brightness of the cells in the inner hair cells, so probably getting multiple genomes, um, but he didn't see this for the outer hair cells. Um, what was uh, interesting, so for the inner hair cells, we got about 70% transduced for XOAV. Seemed to be pretty even across. We saw a steep gradient for both XOAV and, uh, um, and standard AV for this method but um, going from about 40% to uh, about 15. And then the round window membrane injection, um, similarly, we got uh, really good transduction of the, of the inner hair cells, um, and we did get a boost in the outer hair cells. Um, what I found uh, interesting is we didn't see that gradient with, with this group. Could be the 
just you know the different uh, injection route, how it circulates. But um, we had about 25 to 30 percent of outer hair cells transduce to this method, and you're looking at about 90 percent of inner hair cells. Now, as I mentioned, this is a, a, a variable technique. All the data I've shown you is from every mouth that Ben's injected. So we did the maybe the poorer injections and the and the and the good ones. So this just shows you our one of our best injections with XOAV, where you you can achieve essentially 100% <coughs> transduction throughout the entire cochlea. And we also looked in the vestibular system, which is important because many of these um, uh, hearing loss diseases also affects balance and vestibular function. So we look at the 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 cells and the hair cells in the um, uh, vestibular system, and we found both. Um, uh, we, f we found an enhancement for XOAV or AV1 in terms of the transduction of, of hair cells. And we also looked in after cochleostomy in another experiment, and we did see good transduction, um, really with both vectors. Um, so we can deliver to the both, both hair cell types. Uh, we did see a, a rather promiscuous transduction throughout the cochlea, at least with our current promoter. We use a br broadly active CBA promoter. Um, so you can see we, for both vets, AV1 and XOAV1, we transduce Henson cells, Claudia cells, cells of the inner sulcus and uh, spiral ganglion cells. So now that we've shown we could get decent uh, transduction, we went on to test, um, test the system as a, in, a, in a deafness model. So um, David had this model in his lab, um, Team HS, it uh, stands for Tetra Span Membrane Protein of Hair Cell Stereocilia, real mouthful. Um, it's an integral, integral component of the mechanical transduction machinery. So the hair cells in these knockout mice show redux, reduction in mechanical transduction currents. They're deaf and have um, vestibular dysfunction. I'll show you some videos coming up. It's a known deafness locus in humans. Um, it's, I think it's fairly rare. Um, and uh, it's, this is the same gene, the LHFPL5. I know I have a couple of videos that say the latter. So don't get confused, we're using the same um, trans gene and gene throughout these experiments I'm gonna show. So one of the assays we use, David uses in his lab is FM143 uptake. It's an assay for the, the ability of uh, TMHS to rescue these knockout cells. The dye uptake generally correlates with functional mechanical transduction. Cells that are dead or dying um, don't take up the dye. And then we built this vector um, that encodes TMHS, it was a self complementary AV vector, tested for expression, and then we packaged it in our XOAV1 system. So first in culture, uh, the green signal isn't GFP, so uh, keep that in mind, it's the FM143. So these are um, heterozygotes, uh, which are normal hearing mice, and you can see they have good dye uptake. The knockout mice just have debris and kind of autofluorescence, and you can see in the knockouts treated with the vector in culture, we can see good rescue. And Bent quantitated this really carefully to show that um, we did see a bit of a gradient, which um, is not too much of a surprise, but at least at the base, we had um, the same level of rescue as the, the heterozygote mice, but we're way over the knockouts at every, at every spot. Um, and he also looked at localization. Uh, these TMHS should localize to the stereocilia, the chip links, and we saw localization at the, at the chip links as expected. He also did this staining in vivo after direct injection of the XOAV TMHS vector into the inner ear of um, neonatal mice. And what he observed was um, staining, this is staining for HA, and high magnification microscopy looked at, um, you're seeing the, the chip links of the hair cells, and you can see localization at the chip links of TMHS. We have an HA tag there, so um, it looks like it's that correct localization. Um, he also did up dye FM143 uptake, and we saw rescue, um, partial, a decent amount of rescue. And he quantitated the HA stain from the previous uh, image and got about 70% of inner and 30% of outer hair cells throughout the cochlea, which was fairly consistent with our GFP data. So then we did AVR testing to see if these mice could hear um, that, we, that we injected with the vector. So, the auditory brainstem response measures brain's electrical signal in response to sound. Um, so basically these are the waveforms at different um, sound intensities. 
So you can see a normal hearing heterozygote mice has many different waveforms. This is the knockout mice, which is completely deaf. That's just background signal. And in our uh, in treated mice, um, we got rescued down to about 70 decibels in our best treated mice. So um, they're not normal hearing, but uh, 70 decibels is kind of a, a loud conversation level. Uh, and you can see this is a, um, a normal hearing mouse uh, for uh, comparison, um, non-treated. And these are the knockouts, so they're completely deaf. And these are all the mice who we in, that we treated. So you see the different vary, varying levels of rescue across different frequencies and thresholds of, of uh, detection. So we also wanted to see if this system could be potentially toxic because um, we were it's a strong promoter, we're overexpressing TNHS. So we injected normal hearing, the heterozygote uh, TNHS mice with um, either non-injected or with X-ray AV, and we didn't see any adverse effects on their hearing. So that was one measure that it looked like, at least for the short term, it was, it was tolerated, well tolerated. So I'm going to show you some videos now. So the first is a startle response. The mice hear a loud sound or a clap. They can't see your <laughs> the hand, so they're not responding to that. Um, uh, and they kind of freeze, so it's a little bit subtle, but um, I think you'll see it. And the knockout mice generally doesn't have a response to that. So this is a normal hearing mouse. I think you saw it freeze there. Oh, the sound's not working, but you can see the clap. <laughs> This is a knockout mice, which doesn't respond to the sound. This is one of our treated mice. And we also looked at um, vestibular function using a, a circling behavior assay. Um, so I'm going to show you this. Uh, the normal mouse on, on uh, normal hearing heterozygote shows normal exploring behavior. Just wants to get out of there. Oops. That shouldn't have been the whole video. Let's see. Let's try it one more time. Otherwise, it's going to be a bummer. Yeah, can you start it? Sorry. I did test it last night, so. Sorry. Thanks for bearing with us here. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's totally frozen. All right, we're going to be uh, having a little downtime here. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, <laughs> yeah we can, yeah, exactly. So far, yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, from what I've seen, congratulations, very nice work. And uh, Thank you. I must say, those that EM with the oh, are you ready? No, or it's no, still no, no. rebooting. Okay, uh, the EM yep. is so it's very nice to see that with the the AV within the exosome. That's yeah, it was a great yeah. collaborator. Yeah, yeah. Um, qu uh, two quick questions. So yeah. you aren't ta you aren't really assessing any type of immune uh, ability to penetrate through antibodies here. You're just looking at transduction, I think, efficiency, naked AV yeah. versus the exosome. For the antibody evasion experiment? Well, I oh, think oh, in this right. presentation, there's no antibodies involved here. Oh, you're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. You're absolutely right. In the inner ear, we don't think that's going to be a major Is issue. Right? Okay. Um, I mean, yeah. there's not a lot known in certain, right. like, diseases it could be, but so, yeah. Um, yeah. in general, it's going to be more localized, like the eye, yeah. we think. It's like the yeah. subretinal yeah. injection yeah. type thing, yeah. yeah. And the other quick question is, um, you know, the concept of how much you would need in a human study, you know, you need quite a bit. Do you have a sense when you're making these preparations of the yeah. naked AV, which is obviously the standard procedure from the cells or something yeah. like that, versus the exosomes, is it a challenge to get enough, even for these most studies? Right. Where there's a will, there's a way, I know, eventually, right, but yeah, I'm just yeah, wondering. Yeah. Right. No. Our current 
I would say this, our current production, uh, when I first started out, yes, our current production, our current preps, it's about the same yield as regular AV. Um, but I think there's gonna be some challenges in terms of, we're probably gonna have to use a different method of purification when, when we go for scale up. But um, right now it's not much of a challenge. So if labs wanted to try it, it's you get enough for the mouse injections. Cause you can only, the, the titer is similar and you can only inject like a microliter into the round window membrane. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, it's been very impressive so far. Thank um, you. I was wondering how homogeneous your vector preparations are in other words, are you able to determine like an average number of vector per visitor? Yeah, you know what, that's a great question. And we don't do that for every prep. Um, we, we are only, are we up and running? Oops, yep. Okay, let me get back to it. Um, but no, we don't, we just measure total genome copies. We're that, that's the only thing we're normalizing. Yeah, right now. Okay, I think, is this still the normal mouse? Okay, yeah, you'll be able to tell this is the knockout. So it does this kind of backwards movement and, some, and you'll see some uh, circling behavior. And you can't really see it, but it does a lot of head bobbing, bobbing because of the vestibular dysfunction. So not, needless to say, these mice are not easy to breed. <laughs> <laughs> so it was hard to get enough animals for these experiments. This is one of our injected mice. You can see it. Um, it's more more like the first than the than the last. They seem to be a bit bigger to me too. Uh, I've noticed over looking at these videos a few more times. But Can you advance the slide? I don't want to crash this thing. Okay, thank you. Um, so then uh, Bence uh, and uh, Archer in, in, um, in David Corey's lab quantitated the head tossing and circling. And uh, what I'd like to indicate here down, about five of the mice, that the knockout mice that were treated had completely um, the same, like no head tossing. Um, and it was greatly reduced over the group. And circling was also significantly reduced. Okay, can you advance the slide? All right, so finally we did the swim test. This is a normal swimming mice. I never knew mice could swim like crazy. Look, it loves it. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it doesn't love it, but. All right, this is the knockout mouse. It needs to be rescued very quickly with the uh, fishnet. <laughs> and then, um, Finally, we, ha we saw some ability uh, to swim. Uh, I want uh, to stay above water, we should say. Um, it should, it's important to mention that we only injected one ear, so to restore a full function of the vestibular system, it may be important to inject both, both ears, actually. So to uh, conclude, um, we found that ExoAV provide efficient gene delivery to both inner hair cells and outer hair cells. Uh, we, we achieved partial rescue of hearing imbalance in the mouse model of deafness. And we're currently looking at different capsids in the context of XOAV for improved delivery to the outer cells, because we really feel like that may be one reason why we didn't get better rescue. We need to bump up the outer hair cell transduction. So we're working on that. And it's, I really need to mention it's a rapidly evolving, exciting field right now with a lot of innovative work in many different labs. Uh, there's some great papers from uh, collaborations with uh, Luke Vandenberg and Jeffrey Holt in that group. So, uh, with that, uh, I need to thank my um, all the people that did all the work, especially Bence and uh, a lot of the technicians in lab that put, do, did the vector preps. Of course, um, Alan uh, Falella is on my cost to boot. All my mentors, including Zan, that's sitting here, it's very nice. Um, <coughs> and of course, David Corey's lab. Um, who is uh, a wonderful, exciting to work with collaborator. It's just been, it's been a dream. So uh, with that, um, thank you very much, and I'll take some questions if we have time. Thanks. <laughs>
we'll still have time for a few questions. Yeah, yeah very interesting work. I so, don't think your mic's on. Can I, can I? Yep. Okay. So very interesting work. So my uh, question is based on your crime e EM picture, we can see there must be a few AAV is packaged uh, uh, in the uh, exosome. So based on the talk from Anastasia, we don't know how efficiently uh, the cargo can be released from exosome, is it right? And we cannot control when uh, those cargoes can be released. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And, you know, and, and we don't know the, what's the capsid, which ones are functional and non-functional in there. We don't, we don't really know. What I would say is AAV does have endosomal escape mechanisms um, naturally on the capsid. So I imagine once it's in the cell, um, it can escape the end, exosome and the endosome as it needs to to go to the um, to go to the nucleus. Um, has, otherwise, it wouldn't um, it wouldn't transduce the cell probably. So we think it does, but we don't we haven't looked at it specifically. Yeah. So I think this relates to the uh, question is uh, the dosing. Uh, if you overdose, then we might have uh, tox at the later stage. If you overdose with the exosomes? Uh, yeah, because yeah. we cannot control the, the release rate of the AAV. It could be, yeah. We'll have to, we'll have to see. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, the, the videos clearly show that the knockout mice um, can't walk very well in, in the, uh, the bucket test. Uh, how do the mice perform in a, an open field uh, trial? Do they, they walk more normal? In I wish I had Vince up here because he actually did these experiments. I I, I can't. Uh, I, I didn't. I didn't see that test, so I'm not sure. Sorry. Yeah. Right, well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Last question, please. Yeah. Um, so, how much of the uh, original AAV tropism does the exo AAV retain? So, for example, if I had AAV one versus AAV eight, I had an exo of both of them. Yeah. Exo AAV one versus AAV eight. Yeah. Uh, how would that fare with a systemic induction? So hopefully I understand your question. Are you asking if the two different serotypes in, in exosomes would behave differently in terms of transduction? Yeah, yes. Absolutely, yeah. So it depends on the parent. Yeah, it depends so on the, ca so it's like we've learned, at the beginning I thought it would just take every AAV and then turn it into, like if, it depends on the rate limiting step. So I think uh, if the capsid can't transduce a cell because of like post -ent like post entry things, I mean, the exosome may not be able to overcome that. But if it's at the level of uptake, I think that's primarily what the exosomes are doing, just helping get it into cells. So if you, ha we've seen different transduction efficiencies with different serotypes for sure. Okay. No, yeah. Does it compare, I mean, does it give you the same picture as an AAV8 without an exo? Suppose I have an AAV8 versus an AAV8 exo. Does the overall profile remain the same? Transduction profile, I mean. Oh, for the, um, for the inner ear, um, well, I think it, it's probably cell type dependent. We've seen, so I can tell you we've done work with XOAV8, and actually Amin here is going to be talking about XOAV8 at um, a talk on Saturday. So yes, it does, we do see enhancement of transduction, although in that case we're looking at liver transduction after IV delivery. I don't think we tested it head to head in the inner ear. I think we did. Um, uh, stand, uh, just X away of you in the inner ear. It performed well, but I don't think we did a head to head comparison. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, we don't have time for another question. Unless it's very sh if it's very short, we could take it, but. Yeah, we can talk. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. Thank you.